Okay, that's that. So should be able to see. Don't worry if you haven't got the same um, picture there at first as me. I just added that one. Some of us fiddling about with. Um, what we're going to start off with today um, on that. Um, so again, it's in the Christmas Carol, and we're still on that. The comparison between Christmas past and Christmas present. Okay, and um, we're going to kick kick off with them. Um, just make the size a wee bit lesser at the moment. So, totally visual. There we are. So we're going to start off with this um, task here. Um, because yesterday we looked very much at um, the two sort of comparisons of Christmas present um, and Christmas past, and we saw how it had developed and how the the characteristics of Christmas had changed. But we we talked about how and um, we ended up. If you remember the lesson, we talked about how the um, mood was going to get progressively darker. Um, as this chapter goes on, um, we start off with, you know, the, the sort of, even in our sort of kind of modern day um, idea of uh, Father Christmas, and uh, you know, that kind of excess, lots of food, lots of celebration, lots of joviality. Uh, the spirit himself being described as a jolly giant, obviously a lot more confident. And we can think about that because Christmas is now kind of firmly established in, in you know, Victorian society. It's this big celeb celebration. And so there's that sort of positivity about it. And then the spirit, and as you recall, when the spirit, um, does the spirit have to ask Scrooge to go outside with him on his travels? Or does Scrooge volunteer to go outside with the spirit? Um, that question goes directly to Christian to welcome him back into the room from yesterday. He volunteers. Doesn't he? And again, so again, we can begin to see that change, isn't it? Because as you remember when you read it in the text, you know, he sort of bows his head down and he just says to the, the spirit straight away, you know, do what you must, um, to sort of paraphrase him. And so again, that shows you already the development, the change that has taken place in Scrooge. Um, what's the other strange thing about this second visitation? Because remember, he was told that they were going to come at precise times. Um, Leon, where is Scrooge when the second spirit um, visits him? You know, when, at the beginning of, of, of that stave three, where is Scrooge when Christmas present arrives? Uh, he was in his, like, bed and then he saw the light come through under the door yeah, that's right and, and does he go straight away to the to to the room leon no. no can you remember how long does he wait roughly uh five or ten minutes oh you yeah, just five minutes yeah just five minutes that's off he goes yeah 10 minutes went by then 15 and it's on 15 minutes that he decides to walk into the room so again why is that important jess frith um, what's different about this second visitation of the spirit of Christmas from the first? If we focus on that aspect that Scrooge stays in his bed for around 15 minutes and then goes off to meet the spirit, how is that different to the, the visitation of the first spirit? Because he could have he could have stayed in his bed and not gone to see the second spirit. Good. But Instead, yeah. he chose to, whereas with the first spirit, he didn't really volunteer as much. He was sort of, um, it, was, it wasn't as much as, of his choice to be able to go and see the first spirit. He was, it was, but for the second spirit, he could have w waited a lot longer than he actually did. So it yeah. really shows that he wanted to see it of some, in some form. That's it. That's it. Spot on. Well done, Jess. Isn't it? Because you get the idea that this isn't it. It's the idea that, that the spirit is waiting for Scrooge to come to him rather than, and as you see, the first one kind of seeks him out because it has to. But here, again, it shows that change just as he allows, just as Scrooge volunteers to, to the spirit to say, take me where you will. Scrooge goes to the spirit. The spirit doesn't go to, to, to Scrooge. And again, that's, that's another important change here. OK, good. And again, all of these questions, all showing me that you've done the reading over Christmas, that you know the text there. So that's really good. I'm pleased with that. Well done. Um, now, as you'll see, we go outside, and this is the first description that we get um, of London outside. Okay, and it's the house fronts look black enough, and the windows black are contrasting with the smooth white uh, sheet of snow 
upon the roofs, and with the dirtier snow upon the ground, which last deposit had been ploughed up in deep furrows of heavy wheels of carts of wagons, furrows that crossed and recrossed each other hundreds of times, where the great streets branched off and made intricate channels hard to trace in the thick yellow mud and icy water. The sky was gloomy, and the shortest streets were choked up with a dingy mist, um, half thawed, half frozen, whose heavier particles descended in a shower of sooty atoms, as if all the chimneys in Great Britain had, by one consent, caught fire and were blazing away to their dear heart's content. Okay, now, what I want you to do is the following, um, and I'm going to give you a bit of time to do that. I want you to analyse that, that that short extract there of, of London when... Scrooge is first stepping out of the ghost of Christmas past. And I want you, one, to think about the mood that is being created there, but also um, the following. So I want you to... Focus on the use of language. So that's like choice of words. Yeah. Um, are the common themes sort of um, links running throughout, you know, again, is it, is it a similar style of, of, of language that he's using? So what we're kind of looking at for there is that use of, it might be sort of synonyms. You know, running metaphors where, where it's got that common bond going through throughout, okay? The use of imagery that it has here. Um, and then obviously atmosphere. Yeah, what techniques are being used? Think of literary techniques that are being used um, by Dickens here to, in this extract to kind of set the mood and, and, and change the tone. And I'm look at how this sort of sharp contrast is coming between obviously this sort of jolly giant that we're introduced to right at the start of, of, of the chapter, and then we, we, we come to a very different scene here. Okay. Um, so. I will give you, it's just coming up to nine o'clock now. So if I give you, say, 15 minutes to do that, obviously extract your quotes from that extract. Um, or if you want to sort of, you know, highlight, annotate um, on, on, your, on your device, that can work too. But make sure you've got some notes there written down that you, you can begin to discuss with me. I say um, 15 minutes, so we'll take that to quarter past nine. While you're doing that, I'll go and sort of chase up Nathan and Simeon, um, who I don't think have arrived in the lesson yet. Um, okay, oh no, again, as before, you can drop out of the lesson here to do that. I'll call you back in at quarter past nine. Is that okay for everybody? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, again, unsure of anything, obviously, message me in Teams while, while you're doing that, and we'll, we'll come back in in 15 minutes, okay? Right. Cool, cool, cool. So if I go on to here. No, I don't want to go into there. And I want to go on to here. Uh, Oops, not Natalie.
Right, so we can do that, can't we? I think, uh, stop copying now. 